Hey, good morning. Good to see you. I just really want to go home right now because uh, that was so good, you know. That was good, but I spent some time studying and praying, so you got to hear something. <laughs> We're going to have communion. We're going to have communion uh, in a few minutes. Um, man, what a good morning. I had the best morning. I'm having the best morning. Now it's afternoon now, but I got up this morning like six something early, and my wife is standing there with a cup of coffee like this with a big cheesy smile on her face. It was almost like she was saying, Master. <laughs> she wasn't because we all know who's boss. But it was, I was like, that's how I woke, I woke up, man. It was like, wow, there's a beautiful woman handing me a cup of coffee. That's like, bam, that's a good morning. And uh, then I got a text from somebody, and I'm going to read it. In a, in a couple minutes here uh, about a breakthrough they had in their life. It's like, my eyes aren't even focusing. I'm, I'm reading this testimony. It was incredible. Um, and then I uh, got a call from Pakistan and prayed for a bedridden pastor this morning over the internet and video. And uh, so I'm believing he's like experiencing healing right now. Uh, and then uh, it hit me that the Seahawks are in the playoffs. Like, what? What? What a day, man. What a day. Oh, sorry. Ah, uh, you beat us last week. How many of you do set resolutions? Can I, just for the record, you know, when Sean was saying that about me, I don't do resolutions because I'm so bad at it and I fail so miserably at it. I just, they don't work. And then I read the stats, 90% of the people, they don't keep their resolutions. So we're all just a bunch of losers, you know. It doesn't work, you know. But you know something, I'm going to tell you something that I have. To, yeah, look at this. I mean, God, welcome to our world, huh? Yeah, this year, that year, lose, well, what the heck, you know, get fit. Next year, <laughs> give up alcohol and cigarettes. Well, drink less. Uh, <laughs> stand up to the boss and <laughs> find a job. <laughs> I think that's fun. Try to, yeah, right, <laughs> my ex-wife, oh, gosh. Yeah, they don't work. I tell you, I'm just going to tell you what I've done over about the last seven years uh, and you can adopt this because it may work for you. But for some reason, lists. I would go list heavy. You know, goals, resolutions, all this stuff, man. And then seriously, it would like take two weeks to like, such a loser. This like just doesn't work for me, you know. And, but what I did start doing about six or seven years ago was asking God for a word that will shape my year. God, give me the word. Don't, you know, just don't pull some word out of nowhere. But God, what, give me a word that will define my year, that will form and shape my prayers and adjust my vision. And I have found that when I just got one word, it was like that was kind of my whole goals resolution. And that would really do some incredible things. I remember, I remember one year it was, it was grace. I said, God, what's the word? He said, grace. And then he quickened Hebrews 13, 9, let your heart be established by grace. And in that single sentence that the Lord spoke, it was like he unre uh, un unveiled to me the legalism that I had been uh, embracing unknowingly, that I had just somehow slipped into a lot of works and a lot of shoulds and a lot of ought tos and a lot of I better and if I don't and I should and all those kinds of things. And then all of a sudden it was like he was saying, I want you to really get this because this, your heart's going to be established by something. And trust me, you don't want legalism as the anchor in your heart. You want grace. And that was one year. Another year it was reset. He, he said, look at everything you're doing and continue to do the same things. Do it in a different way. He said, he said reset the way you pastor. You've been a pastor a long time. I want you to reset and rethink how you shepherd, how you lead, how you love people. Do a reset in everything. And so for the last, uh, I don't know how many years, I've been doing a word, word, word. And then it's kind of morphed into like four words, you know. So last year there was four words. And then this year, you know, I'm reading um, Mark 10, and I'm seeing the story of blind Bartimaeus. And, and there's four words that kind of call out and cause us to pay attention. So if you're wordless for 2019, you, you might just kind of pay attention because these words really kind of describe what's going on in this scenario. Um, you know, here's what occurs to me, uh, that when Jesus encounters people, when you go through the Gospels, Jesus never sees a stuck person and looks at them and says, bummer. He doesn't. Now, some of you think he does. Some of you think Jesus has looked at your situation, looked at you and said, bummer. He doesn't because you don't, you don't find scriptures to support that. You see a Jesus who's very involved. 
very, I mean, it, if you don't get a- anything from up to this point in the service, I think we would agree that Jesus is interactive. He's involved. He loves to interrupt. He loves to interrupt patterns of thinking that you've had for a long time that have kept you in bondage. He loves to interrupt it. And how does he interrupt it? He interrupts it with truth. Because I guarantee a lot of the patterns of thinking that we get are lies. But we've just gone along with them. And this, Jesus comes and brings a word of truth and causes a divine interruption. That's a good thing. And, and you're going to see an interruption here. And you're going to see some opposition. And this can be good. Mark 10, 46. They came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Here's the first word, awareness. And the question I want to ask is, what's your reality? What's your reality? See, a lot of times people don't change and don't transform because they don't acknowledge the true condition of their soul. They don't acknowledge the true condition of their thinking. They don't acknowledge the true condition of their sin. Because it's easier to pretend things are okay than it is to actually let God and people into the dark places of your soul. It's easy. You're programmed, man. If you've been to church longer than a month, you're kind of programmed. You're conditioned that when people ask you how you're doing, you say, good, great. We do. Everybody has kind of an automatic response. Very rarely do you get somebody, how you doing? You know, can I, can I just tell you my life is sucking right now? And you, you got like three hours, sit down, man, and fasten your seatbelt, because I got hell going on. We don't do that, because it's just easier. guys. Ah, good. It's good. How you doing? Praise the Lord, brother. Jargon. Jargon's easy. But awareness. You can't change what you don't acknowledge. You know, I think about Luke 15, the prodigal. I love this guy. He just, like all of us, he goes, blows every good thing in his life. I love it with the sentence. It says, and he wasted his life on prodigal living. You know what prodigal living is? It's just self-indulgence. It's just hedonism. It's just do whatever you want. It's squandering every good thing in your life. Debauchery. Bad stuff. And then he goes broke. (laughs) Because that's what sin always does to you. You go broke. You lose everything. Always. Lose everything. He lost everything. So he gets hired to work in a pig pen, and he's Jewish. That's a bad place to be. That's a bad day, man. You're in a pig pen, and you're slopping pigs, and you're hungry. And you're looking at the pig slop, and you're actually thinking, that doesn't look bad. That's your state. And you know what it says? I love this. He's just sitting there, man. And it says this, he said, he came to himself. That's an aha moment. It's like, what the heck is going on here? He became very aware. And see, when you become aware, then you can entertain God's possibility. See, it's only when you actually acknowledge it and say, okay, there's got to be something else. He started to entertain, there's got to be something else. You know, maybe I can go back, maybe I can at least be hired, I can have a job, I can at least eat different. At least I can have a roof over my head. You know, at least, at least there's possibility of change. See, it's when you get real, you know. When, when do you call yourself out on stuff? When do you ever just, like, you know, just say, wow, you know what? Enough is enough. Or when do you invite the Lord to convict you? Once again, if you perceive God as gracious and merciful, you'll invite conviction. If you think he's harsh and judgmental, you just stay away from it. When you know Jesus as he really is, full of, full of, everybody say full of, full of mercy. He doesn't have a you know, little, little mercy. I got a little left. Uh-uh. No, no, full of mercy, full of grace, full of truth. See, when you know that about him, you'll invite him in. You'll say, examine my heart. That's what Paul told the Corinthians. Examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Do you not know yourselves? I would say a lot of people really lack self-awareness. I think a lot of people, man, they've, they've married denial. As opposed to just acknowledging, wow, this is what's going on, man. Here's, here's the real deal. You know, the Lord convicted me this year uh, a lot. <laughs> 
Because I'm God's slow son, man. Because it takes me a long time to get stuff. A long time. But he did. He, he, he convicted me. I mean, really, he's convicted me before, but I, I said everything was great and um, moved on. But no, this year there was, a, there was just a couple of really big convictions. One of them was a bad way of thinking that I've had for decades. And it was the thinking that when Thanksgiving was over and I heard the first Christmas song on the radio, I would get angry and depressed. Seriously, this is, if you ask my wife, this has gone on for decades. I'm not going to go into the pathology of it all, but if I told you the reason you go, that makes sense. Just because something doesn't make sense doesn't mean it's right. So it, you, just, you could just set your watch, man, the first Christmas song, and I'm just in a bad mood. And I'm just like, oh, get this season over. Get it out, you know, get the tree down, you know. I mean, seriously, well, I mean, I'm not whining because I didn't get any presents. I'm, I'm just saying there's something that happened. And so every year, this went on for decades. Every was like, just get through this season, get through this month. And then this year, man, it was like I was convicted. I thought the Lord was saying, like, you know, why would you be all sad and depressed at one of the most historic events in the history of mankind where I actually invaded your world. And I thought, wow, that's significant. <laughs> so he confronted me. And here's what I did, man. I, I downloaded two Christmas albums. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, I'm 62. I know I look a lot younger, but I'm 62. <laughs> Whatever. Um, I downloaded two, two worship albums and two Christmas albums, and I went on long drives, and I made myself sing. Now, I'm not even joking, man. I mean, I'm like, I'm that guy. You look, what is he doing? I'm serious. I did that. I drove. I'd go for a drive. Where are you going? I'm going for a drive. <laughs> Crank it up, man. And I forced myself to sing and worship Jesus. And guess what? A change happened. <laughs> Unbelievable. But it started with a conviction. And then, it, start, then it, it started with do something different. Let me ask you a question. How many of you get into that mode? I, I just want to know, how many of you, right after Thanksgiving, man, when you start hearing that Christmas music, you start, you know, it's not good. Raise your, raise your hand. All right, you know what, here's my suggestion. Keep your hand up. Yeah, these are, I have lemons in the front row somebody gave me, and we could all just take them. But... <laughs> I, you know what I think we ought to do? Next year, we all ought to get together and rent like a bus. All of us, people that are prone to little bad attitudes at Christmas, and we're going to crank up the worship, man, and we are, we're going to get sparkling cider, and we're going to just drive around like a bunch of crazy people and worship Jesus. Are you in for that? Are you in for that? Now, not you that you don't have a problem with this. You're not invited to this, to this bus. It's only for us that have these tendencies. So you happy people, you stay away. This is... For us in recovery, <laughs> my name's Bob. I get a bad attitude at Christmas. Hi, Bob. We're here to help. All right. So awareness. When you look at this guy, was he blind? Was he begging? Was he sitting by the road? Had he been there a long time? Listen, that's his reality. That's not his destiny. Wherever you are, that may be your reality, which reality is your friend. You don't need to be afraid of it. It's not your destiny because you got to get this. Everything in your life and everything in my life is subject to change. Everything. How you think, subject to change. How many of you have ever gone from a bad attitude to a good attitude? How many of you have gone from a good attitude to a bad attitude? How many of you have gone from hope-filled, faith-filled to I doubt God even exists? Yeah, always the second service. Wow. Um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Everything is subject to change. Your body, is it subject to change? Especially this time of year, it's subject to change. Everything is subject to change. Your marriage. I, I am not worried, seriously, anymore. I don't get worried about what a person's condition is because I know everything is subject to change. I, I, there are three marriages that I've witnessed this last year that, seriously, if you knew them and if you knew what I knew about them, you would go, over, man. Put the line through it. Casualty. Over. Miraculous turnaround. 
No, sir, I mean, to where I'm kind of going, jeez, man, forgive me for my unbelief, Lord. I'm, I'm talking people that have had decades of dysfunction, decades of poor thinking, decades of an unrenewed mind. And I've seen a miracle, and it's like, God, you're so good. Why did they wait so long? Why do we wait so long? Everything's subject to change. Scripture, the whole Bible, starting in Genesis, where nothing's going on. The earth was out form and void. Nothing's happening. God intervened. God comes in by the Spirit of God and change in the middle of chaos. Everything's subject to change. This, here's the text I got this morning. This is awesome. Pastor Bob, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. So she's making a point here. Today is a Sunday of significance, exclamation point. One year ago, 52 weeks ago, you prayed with me after the service to break those sexual chains that had held me in bondage. I am so glad to be celebrating Jesus today and all the amazing work he has done in my life. I feel like I am celebrating a version of soberness, man, exclamation point. It is freeing, exclamation point, exclamation point. I hope to see you Sunday. Thank you for being a pastor and friend to me. That, you know. Now, once again, she said, I can give her name, I'm not going to do that, um, but her story is one of those ones you just go, man, that is crazy stuff, crazy stuff. But you know, what it, you know, you know where it started? When she acknowledged transparently what was going on in her life. She was embarrassed out of her mind. I remember, like, right back there, embarrassed out of her mind, tears, crying, man. But I, I just said, you know what? There is grace. That shame you've walked in, it's going to go. It's out of here. Power of God's going to set you free because you want to be free. And now you have, and she, first service, she came up, just smile, just free, man, free, exclamation point. <laughs> Do you get it? Free. Yeah, so... Mm. But look what happens. And this, you got to pay attention to this. Verse 48. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. You got a guy, man, a poor, blind, begging guy asking Jesus for something, and many rebuked him. Told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. I like that, man. I like that. Son of David, have mercy on me. You want to know how insidious the devil is? Uh, let, let me just tell you, the devil will steal vision from a blind man. Yes. Sila. Yeah. Pause. Think about that. Guy had a vision to see, and they tried to steal it from him. What if, they, what if he would have went with him? Yeah, you're right. All right, I'm just going to shut up. You know, who the, you know who the many that rebuked him are? They're the same people earlier in the chapter when parents bring kids to Jesus so he'll bless them. And they said, no, 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 no. Don't let the children near him. And what did Jesus say? No, 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 no. Exclamation point. No. We're not doing that. Bring them to me. And he placed his hands on them and blessed them. Sometimes don't take no for an answer. No, serious. It's sometimes, you know, you think, ah, I prayed, blah, 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 blah. Turn it up a notch. Crank it up a notch. Let me tell you something else. Second word, voices. Many voices. Here's the question. Who's trying to shout you down? I'll tell you this. Biblically and experientially, that where there's a great work of God going on, there is great opposition. Every time. And what God's doing in you is nothing less than a great work. That's just the truth. So there's going to be great, there's going to be many voices of opposition. There are going to be external voices come from without. Let me tell you something else. Not everybody is for you. Not everybody's against you either. Oh, they're all out to get me. Not all of them. <laughs> There's external voices saying, no, no, stop believing, blah, 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 blah. Internal voices, those are the worst. They're the voices that have been talking to you for a long time. You know the voices, right? 
is it okay to talk about voices? I'm hearing voices. They're there. Yeah, voices from your past. Voices from trauma. Voices from addiction. Voices of shame. Voices that say you're not good enough. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to get free. Yeah, another testimony. Blah, blah, blah. They got free. Not going to happen to you. You know you've, pretty, you've screwed up so bad. Voice says, I'm all alone. You're all alone. I don't belong. I don't fit. It's not for me. There's something wrong with me. I'm damaged beyond belief. I, it's never going to change. You know those voices. Why pray? You've prayed a thousand times. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep know my voice. My sheep obey my voice. And the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. You got to kick the strange voices out of your head. And you may need to distance yourself from strange voices of opposition that don't want you to succeed. A good word for some of you, boundaries. I, every year I purge some relationships. Not to be mean. But you're not good for my soul, I'm not good for your soul. Aloha on the steel guitar. That's for real. <laughs> is that loving? Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. It is. Jesus didn't hang out with all the people all the time. And sometimes when there was the most, most pressure on his life, he split. Uh, later. He would go somewhere else. Some of you need to have boundaries. People that cause you to compromise, get rid of them. I don't know why I'm being emphatic, but I am. So I don't know who I'm going after. I don't know what I'm going after. You're trying to stay free and clean from addiction, and somebody tries to get you a compromise? Get them out, man. You know what? Get them the hell out of your life. It's a biblical word. No, I'm serious. You're trying to build a marriage, and you got other people that aren't taking their marriage seriously and doing a bunch of compromising and a bunch of goofy stuff? Out. Later. You don't have the guts to do it? Call me. I'll write the letter for you. Yeah. I will. I'm not, I'm not even joking. <laughs> That's it. We're, boundaries. He's talking boundaries one minute. He's got no boundaries the next minute. I'll do it. i do it. There was, oh. there was somebody that was being seduced by somebody years ago. I said, give me their number. I called the dude. I said, you're hitting on a sister of mine in my church. I suggest you back off. Have a nice day. <laughs> Jesus loves you. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying, man, sometimes if you don't have the guts to like get out of the get out of the situation, get somebody that does have the guts to get you out of the situation. Well, hope it's spirit-led. <laughs> How do you drown out opposing voices? By listening to the one voice. And you look at, you look in, you, you, you look at like uh, Elijah the prophet. You look at Nehemiah, you know, who is rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. There's three adversaries that come against him. And they just tell him, they, they mock him, they ridicule him, they tell him to come down, they, they say, leave the work. They call him names, which is kind of funny. Three grown men calling a guy names. They call him names. Ten times they threaten to kill the dude. Ten times, we are going to kill you. Now, I don't know how many of you have had death threats. It can be a little intimidating, right? But ten times they're going to kill you? I think they're serious. You know what he said? He said, I can't come down. The work I'm doing is too great. That's good. What's the one voice saying? What's Jesus saying? See, the many voices are, will irritate. Many voices are ir irritating. The one voice dominates. Many or one? Where do you start? Hey, you know what? This wouldn't be a bad discipline. Grab your Bible and start with all the red letters in the Gospels. 
because that's where Jesus is talking. Start there. You know, forget the, like, I'm going to start in Genesis. I'm going to go through Revelation, you know. And if you haven't picked up the word in a while, it won't work. You may hit Leviticus. It's over. <laughs> Gone. Do the red letters, man. What's Jesus saying? Because, you know, all of Scripture is inspired by God. It's all the words of Jesus. But the red letters, man, what's he saying to you? Voices. What are the voices saying to you? Dial into the one voice. Verse 49. Jesus stopped and said, call him. They called the blind man. Cheer up. On your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. I'll just tell you, I don't like those guys. I wouldn't have liked those guys. So one minute these guys are like, shut up. Don't cry out to him. He's busy. He's calling. Come on. He's calling. It's like, you chameleons, man. You chameleons. It's like, knock on the side of the head. I don't like those guys. Fickle. One minute, they're against you. The next minute, oh, yeah, we're for you. Verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. Isn't that interesting? You're blind. What do you want me to do? Isn't it obvious? No, I mean, it, isn't it obvious? I guess not. Apparently, to Jesus, he doesn't presume what you really want. There's th- actually, there's three places in the Gospels where Jesus said, what do you want me to do? And they were obvious. It was obvious. Why didn't Jesus say, of course you want your sight. You're blind. Yeah, let's do this. What do you want? And what did he say? I want to see. Third word is vision. You know what the prerequisite for vision is? Blindness. A great prayer. God, I don't see nothing. I don't see what you see. I have no vision. I'm blind. Would you open up these eyes so I can see what you see, the way that you see it? I'm blind. You go through Scripture. Spiritual blindness and hard-heartedness are connected. The pure in heart, blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. Holiness and vision go together. Just saying, if you're not seeing clearly, could be a holiness issue. The pure in heart will see God. See, they will perceive, they will understand. They will have insight into his dealings and what he's doing. You won't be clueless. The pure in heart. Do you have a vision? Do you, do you see some things that God is wanting you to see? I mean, you see scriptures where, you know, he says, admit that you're blind. Um, anoint your eyes with eye salve so you can see. Vision. Here's a thought. I'm not just saying this because I'm old. Spiritual vision should increase with age, not decrease. Why? Because the more you've seen allows you to see more. See, when people come for prayer, it doesn't really matter what the condition is. It doesn't, it, I, to me, it's all the same. Addiction, broken marriage, physical healing, it doesn't matter. When I pray, I never look back at when prayer didn't seem to work. I always look back to where I've seen God work and bring healing. It, it's a switch you got to flip. When somebody comes to prayer, it's like, I'm coming on the basis of what I know in Scripture, what I've experienced, what I've seen other people experience. That's what I'm going for. That's how I'm praying. That's where my faith is. I'm not, I'm not going to go, you know, I don't know. It might not work. It, you know, uh, you know, it could be a good day in heaven, bad day in heaven. I don't know, you know. No, you don't do that, man. You just, you, you go because you've seen too much. Do you see? Exclamation point. Do you see? <laughs> Ushers, come on forward, and we're going to pass out communion elements. Vision. You know, I walked through scriptures, and I looked up the greatness of God. I looked up how many times the word great is used with either Jesus, God, different attributes. And it's amazing how much greatness is in scripture. God is referred to as great. His acts are referred to as great. Jesus is referred to as our great God and King. His grace is called great. 
His mercy is called great. You see, great, great, great faith. They had great faith. The apostles, it said, with great power, they gave witness and testimony to the resurrection of Jesus, and great signs followed them. So as I'm, I'm just kind of walking through all this great, 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 and if that's who God is, and if that's who Jesus is, then why would I settle for less than that? Why would I settle for anything in my life that is just less than? Why would I settle for a mediocre marriage? Really? Great God, great love, great grace, great mercy, great power, great reconciliation, and I'm going to settle for, well, you know, this is not great. It's okay. We're not fighting. We're not divorced. Really? I mean, really? Or it's like, you know, I'm just kind of bumping along in my job. I mean, why? Go ahead and pass those out if you would. Why do, you, why do we settle? You have anemia in, in your prayer life. Why do we settle? That's just a great question. Why do we settle? Why do we settle for other people? I always, it's disturbed me for over a year now that when the disciples are in the boat and Peter asks to walk on the water and Jesus says, come, and Peter sinks and goes back, walk, goes back to the boat, I always, it just bugs me. Why did they settle for just sitting in the boat? Why did they settle? I just don't know why they, why wouldn't they think, man, if Peter can do it, I mean, seriously, if Peter can do it, game on. But why would they settle? I wonder why we settle. We see other people doing things. We just say, well, that's them. I think every area of your life, man, if God is really great, if his salvation is really great, shouldn't his freedom be great? Shouldn't his resources be great? Shouldn't we be a part of that? I, I don't know, man. I'm just, this stuff troubles me. I think about it a lot. Why do I settle? Why do I settle for nominalism? Some people settle for, you know, yeah, got saved, 1969. And that's it, man. That's all they got. It's like, well, either God is active and alive or he's not. I think he is. Why would you settle? I don't, hear, I don't hear his voice. Why would you settle for that? If you have scriptural evidence, man, then go for it. Raise your voice all the louder. And it doesn't mean you're not going to fail. Wow, man, I failed. I, I remember <laughs> one time, this is pathetic. I remember one time I get alone with God, man. I found a cabin. I drove two hours to get to this cabin. I brought 48 bottles of water. I'm going to fast. <laughs> I just thought you bring a case, two cases of water. I get there. I pray for 10 minutes. And I start missing my girlfriend. Oh, I wonder what she's doing. <laughs> I crack the Bible. I read a chapter. I drink some more water. I start getting hungry. I didn't bring any food. And I start thinking about my girlfriend, who's my wife now. I bailed after an hour. One hour. One hour. That's all I could do. <laughs> I had a cabin that was overlooking the Hood Canal, man, up in Washington. It was beautiful. I lasted maybe two hours. Felt like a failure, but I married the girl. <laughs> so it wasn't a total loss. Press in. You know, this last word, cooperation. You know, that whole Luke 6, good tree doesn't bear bad free, fruit. Bad tree doesn't bear good fruit. Tree is known by its fruit. And he says, a good man out of the good treasure in his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasure in his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, so when I see that, Harvest is inevitable. Right now, right, whoever you are, you're experiencing a harvest. Guaranteed. In every area of your life, there is some kind of harvest. You're bringing it forth. Notice it says, the man brings it forth. 
We always get a little confused. Well, is it God's will? Is it, I mean, is God doing this? Am I doing this? Who's responsible for what? You're responsible to abide with him. I'm responsible to stay close to him. He does what he wants. The fruit is up to him. I don't really care what the fruit looks like as long as it's God fruit. But the man brings it forth. Notice what Jesus said to the blind man. Your faith made you whole. I mean, who did the healing? Jesus. But he said, your faith. I guess here's my question, man. Will you accept responsibility for the condition of your life? I mean, Matt, we live, we live in a day and a time and a culture where we love to blame and make excuses, and I'm a victim, and I was born this way or in this place, and you don't know my family, you know my, I mean, we just, we got that all over the place. But I don't, I don't think that, is, blame never helped anybody. Excuse making never helped anybody. Now, there have been contributing factors for sure, man, for sure. Why don't you just accept the fact that you're responsible for what you allow into your heart? Take ownership for your heart. For it is God who works in you to will and do his good pleasure, but you've got to open the door. You've got to open the depository. Yeah. That's a big question. Accepting responsibility. My prayer life when it's anemic, is because I'm not praying. I used to say the devil made me do it, but that just doesn't fly. No. That's why repentance is such a beautiful thing. Changing our minds, aligning our minds. You know, Proverbs 19.3 says, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they blame God. Silly people. You can't blame God. Accept responsibility. You don't like what you see, change it. You don't like your harvest, change it. You don't like what's coming out, change, change it. Change the seeds. Change it. Do something different. You don't have to settle. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> really, I don't. <laughs> this is all the stuff that has only slapped me around for about 37 years. <laughs> you just happened to get <laughs> some of it from me. Sorry. It's true. Man. Hmm. That's just all true. It's all true. Serenity is what we get when we quit hoping for a better past. Man, there's all kinds of stuff in my past that I don't like, that I wish would have been different. But what are you going to do? Obsess? Oh, if I just would have had a loving mom and dad. You didn't. You didn't. They were abusive. They were horrible. Nothing's going to change it. Nothing. It's what, it's what it was. But how will you live now? Bitterness and bondage or forgiveness and freedom? Seriously. Yeah, let's examine our hearts. Do you, do you get that everything is subject to change? Do you believe that? Let's stand up. You got to get that. It's all subject to change. We take communion. We acknowledge the price was paid for sin. It was paid. You're not going to add to it. Your morality, your goodness, your promises, your intentions, not going to add nothing. Body was broken. Blood was shed. Game over. That's what salvation is. All you and I are doing, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know what? One, my life is one long thank you, Jesus. That's all it is. I need him. Let's take the wafer. He was broken. For me. For you. Wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. 
he got what we deserved. We add nothing to the equation. Aaron gave me his communion and the wafer broke in half perfectly. That's pretty good. Let's hold the wafer up. Jesus, I acknowledge my brokenness before you. Pray you make it very hard for people to hide. Because you were broken, we can be transparent. So I pray that people would be transparent with you. They would not hide. They would not pretend. They would acknowledge their true condition before you. Flawed, but loved by God. We sin, but we're forgiven by God. So we thank you for your body broken. We ask you to bring wholeness into our lives as you see fit in the name of Jesus. Amen. I always love the, the verse in Hebrews that says that the sacrifice of Jesus was offered once as an eternal sacrifice, an eternal offering, and that his blood that was shed cleanses our conscience from acts that led to death. It's one thing to be forgiven. It's another thing to have your conscience dealt with to where you're not feeling guilty, guilty and horrible all the time. Oh, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for your love, for your blood, for your sacrifice, for newness of life. How many of you would say that you're just aware of areas of your life that you've settled, you've just settled for, and God's kind of prompting you to press through that? Would you just raise your hands? Okay. So, Father, the power that we have is not in and of ourselves. It's in you. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the blood of Jesus that allows us and calls us and to walk in the newness of life. So I pray, God, expose the areas we've just settled. And, God, I pray where there needs to be boundaries in relationships, you would help people draw those lines. So we thank you for forgiveness and freedom in the name of Jesus. And everybody said...